Good afternoon. My name is Rafael Espinar. I am the chair of the Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committee. I want to thank my colleague, Chairman Landsman of the Justice System Committee for making this joint hearing possible. Today we'll be hearing intro 724 and intro 510A. 724 is a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to requiring that bail bond businesses make certain disclosures. Bail bond businesses are bad actors who have been known to exploit members of vulnerable and underprivileged communities. We call upon the state to make much needed amendments to the New York's bail bonds laws, but until then, the City Council is committed to doing what it can to combat the practices of these unscrupulous businesses. The use of commercial bail bond agents is a unique practice that only exists in the U.S. and the Philippines. And along with cash bail, it is the most common form of securing release in New York City. While data is scarce, scarce it is estimated that approximately 11,000 New Yorkers use commercial bail bonds each year. When a judge orders a commercial bail bond as a form of bail, the defendant or someone acting on their behalf secures the bond payment by paying a non-refundable fee to a commercial bail agent and providing collateral, which should be returned after the finalization of the case if the defendant has made all of their court appearances and complied with any other condition of their bond. As a for-profit business, bail bond companies charge a fee for securing the bond, but New York State law limits the amount that agents can charge for this premium generally around 10% of the, for the, of the bail, bond, bail amount. While state law specifically prohibits the charging of additional fees, many bail bond companies circumvent these laws and charge illegal fees. Recently, the Department of Consumer Affairs filed an action against bail bond agent Marvin Morgan and the companies that employed him for using these illegal tactics. Marvin Morgan has been illegally charging extra fees designed to look like add-on services. For example, he would charge up to $1,000 for courier services, despite the law clearly prohibiting such fees. He also often failed to return collateral to consumers, did not provide consumers with copies of the bond paperwork, and provided misleading or inaccurate receipts. While state law governs the use of bail, there is more than the city can do to protect consumers. Their, their pretrial experience is a particularly stressful time for the defendant and their loved ones, and securing a bail bond can be especially burdensome. The urge to do whatever necessary to secure the release of the defendant makes these consumers particularly vulnerable to predatory and deceptive practices from bail bond agents. This is why we are hearing these bills today, which will require bail bond businesses to provide customer, consumers with, one, a bill of rights, two, proper contracts and receipts, and three, other relevant information necessary to equip consumers to know their rights and make complaints if necessary. We look forward to hearing from the administration, industry reps, and advocates to learn more about the recommendations regarding intros 510A and 724. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the members of uh, my committee on consumer affairs who have joined us. We have uh, Councilman Peter Koo from Queens, and we also have uh, Councilman Debbie Rose from Staten Island, uh, who's in Rory Lansman's committee, and he'll be joining us in a few minutes to uh, uh, give testimony on, on the bills as well. But uh, I believe we can begin uh, with, with DCA. Please, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and answer council member questions honestly? I do. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Espinal and members of the Committees on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing and the Justice System. My name is Casey Adams and I am the Director of City Legislative Affairs for the New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. I am joined today on this panel by our Deputy General Counsel, Michael Tiger, and by Staff Counsel, Glenna Goldus. We would like to thank you for inviting DCA to testify about Introductions 510A and 724 both of which relate to regulation of the for-profit bail bond industry in New York City. DCA supports both of these bills, and we commend their sponsors, Speaker Johnson, as well as Chairs Lansman and Espinal, as well as the members of both committees, for focusing on an issue that has a crucial impact on the lives of vulnerable New Yorkers. Today, I will offer brief comments about possible adjustments that we think would strengthen these proposals and enhance DCA's ability to ensure that consumers are armed with the information they need to protect themselves and to hold businesses that wrong them accountable. New Yorkers are forced to turn to the for-profit bail bond industry at moments of desperation, when a loved one is behind bars and counting on them for help getting home. Bail can run into thousands of dollars, often requiring far more money than the average New Yorker can produce unexpectedly and at a moment's notice. 
According to recent reports, the for-profit bail bond industry has grown to a size of $14 billion nationally by offering these people in need the opportunity to bring their loved ones home in exchange for a percentage of the bail amount and temporary posting of collateral by the consumer. Large insurance companies called sureties issue the bonds posted in court. They control bail bond agents through webs of contracted managers. Bail bonds agents do the work of actually arranging transactions with desperate consumers. It is these low-level bail bond agencies, which often operate out of neighborhood storefronts clustered around courthouses, that are the most visible part of the for-profit bail bond industry. Unfortunately, the services provided by this industry have all too often been accompanied by deceit, deception, and abuse of those who come for help when they are at their most vulnerable. Shorties and bail bond agents must be licensed by the New York State Department of Financial Services, more commonly known as DFS. State law imposes a number of requirements on bail bond agents, the most important of which is a limit on the premium or compensation that may be charged for posting a bond or property as bail. According to data obtained from the DFS database, there are currently 20 business entities licensed as bail bond agents, operating a total of 29 offices around New York City. In addition, there are 84 individuals licensed as bail bond agents in our city. These entities and individuals work with 25 sureties registered with DFS. All but four of those sureties are headquartered in states other than New York. Because bail bond agents are the individuals and companies that consumers interact with directly, entrust with their collateral, and pay premiums and compensation to in exchange for services, they are the source of many of the complaints about unacceptable practices in the industry. Unlike DFS, DCA does not have broad regulatory authority over the for-profit bail bond industry. However, companies involved in this industry, like all businesses that engage in consumer transactions in New York City, are covered by the city's consumer protection law. The CPL, which DCA enforces, prohibits deceptive or unconscionable trade practices. In February, DCA invoked this authority to bring an action in New York State Supreme Court against bail bond agent Marvin Morgan, as well as the shorties and management companies that worked with him for engaging in deceptive and unlawful trade practices. In our complaint, DCA alleges numerous violations of the CPL, including repeatedly and persistently deceiving consumers by charging illegal fees in excess of the compensation cap, failing to refund collateral to consumers after bail had been discharged, refusing to provide consumers with required documentation of transactions, and providing incomplete or misleading information on receipts. We are asking the court to award almost $60,000 in fines and restitution for 16 consumers and to establish a restitution fund for affected consumers who may come forward in the future. While we will only be able to discuss this case in general terms today because the litigation is still pending, DCA is proud of this action. The filing of this case puts all corporate insurance companies, management companies, and bail bond agents on notice that illegal and exploitative behavior will not be tolerated by DCA. I will now turn to introductions 510A and 724, which would arm consumers with information about their rights and the legal responsibilities of entities engaged in the for-profit bail bond industry and give DCA new tools to ensure that consumers are educated and informed. Introduction 510A, sponsored by Chairs Lansman and Espinal, requires bail bond businesses to post a disclosure informing consumers of the premium and compensation limit imposed by state law. In addition, it requires DCA to establish a complaint mechanism for consumers to report violations of this law and refer any complaints received to the New York Police Department for investigation. DCA strongly supports this effort to give consumers the information they need to protect themselves and guide complaints to the agency empowered to take action when consumer harm occurs. We would like to offer the Council a few brief suggestions that we think will clarify and strengthen the proposal. Uh, first, we think the bill would benefit from giving DCA greater flexibility to specify the content of the required disclosure by rule. Currently, the bill includes language that must be included on a disclosure and cannot be modified except by law. Revising the bill's language to specify the substantive points that the disclosure must cover, at a minimum, and allowing DCA to update or add information by rule would give the department the flexibility to ensure that this, this disclosure stays up to date with changes in state laws and rules. This approach is already taken and similar disclosures required in other industries, and we believe this change would make the law more responsive to any future changes in the legal landscape. 
Next, DCA supports the development of robust complaint mechanisms. Indeed, this is something we do for all of the laws we enforce. And we want to make sure that consumers are directed to the government agency that is best equipped to help them in the first instance. It is all too easy for a consumer who has passed between different agencies at different levels of government to become discouraged and just give up on getting help. Because DFS is the entity charged by state law with licensing bail bond agents, they are better positioned than DCA to respond to complaints on a routine basis. We believe that the council shares these understandings and these goals, as the other bill, Introduction 724, mandates that DCA's Consumer Bill of Rights direct consumers to file complaints with the appropriate city and state agencies. Under both bills, DCA would continue to refer any and all complaints that fall outside our jurisdiction to the correct agency. Of course, if DCA were to discover particularly egregious cases of deceptive practices, we would also conduct our own investigation and evaluate all appropriate remedies as we have done in the past and in the case we've mentioned earlier. DCA looks forward to working with the council on our suggestions and others we will hear from advocates today as intro 510A moves through the legislative process. I will now turn to the second bill, Introduction 724. Intro 724, sponsored by Speaker Johnson, provides consumers of the for-profit bail bond industry with information regarding their rights and basic information about the business, businesses and individuals to whom they turn for help bringing a loved one home. Specifically, the bill requires bail bond businesses and those that refer consumers to these businesses for a fee to post and distribute and con a, a, to con customers a bill of rights to be developed by DCA. In addition, the bill requires covered entities to provide consumers with a copy of all documents they sign. As with intro 510A, we strongly support this effort and will offer suggestions on strengthening the bill to the council's consideration. First, we are glad to see that the bill requires bail bond agents to provide a detailed receipt at the time of a transaction. During the investigation that led to our February case, DCA attorneys found that some bail bond agents either refused to provide receipts altogether or provide receipts with incomplete or inaccurate information. Without detailed and accurate records of a transaction, it is very difficult for consumers to hold bail bond agents accountable. We think that this provision could be strengthened by requiring more specific information about a transaction. For example, the amount of a bond, the name of the surety that issued the bond, a description of collateral or security, and a clear statement of any money paid to a third party and the purpose for that payment. This change could be accomplished either by amending the bill's language or giving DCA the authority to specify additional required information by rule. Requiring bail bond agents to provide detailed receipts will help consumers both to protect themselves from harm in the first place and to seek effective redress when they are harmed. Second, we suggest that bail bond businesses be required to retain an initialed copy of each Consumer Bill of Rights. Requiring an initialed copy of the Consumer Bill of Rights be retained, as is done in other industries with these types of documents, like paid income tax preparers and secondhand car dealers, will help ensure that each consumer is given the chance to review the document and give DCA an important tool for holding businesses accountable if a consumer later complains. Similarly, we believe that businesses should be required to keep detailed records of transaction documents and receipts for a period of years and make them available to the department upon request. While these entities are already required to keep certain records, as well as produce receipts, as I described earlier, under DFS rules, these mandates are not currently enforceable by DCA. Codifying robust record keeping and receipt provisions in local law will help DCA investigate and remedy consumer harm as well as monitor compliance with new requirements. DCA would like to thank both committees for the opportunity to testify before this joint hearing. Through our recent investigation, we saw firsthand how certain players within the for-profit bail bond industry prey on vulnerable New Yorkers desperate to help bring their loved ones home. Speaker Johnson and Chairs Lansman and Espinal should be commended for shining a spotlight on this complex and important issue. We support the intent of Introductions 510A and 724 and appreciate the chance to offer suggestions on how they could be clarified and strengthened. We look forward to discussing these suggestions and other minor technical amendments in greater detail with the council. Thank you very much, and I will be happy to take all your questions. Thank you. Uh, before we move forward, I just want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Brad Lander from Brooklyn, Margaret Chin from Manhattan, um, Karen Koswitz from Queens, and Rory Lansman has uh, some words to say on his bill. No, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a couple questions okay. if that's all right. Good. Um, thank you very much for your testimony, and I appreciate the, uh, the, um, 
the ideas that you have for improving the bill, they're, they're good ideas. I look forward to, to working with you. Um, one aspect of, of the recommendation that you make, though, is um, that uh, complaints should be directed to DFS, and I, I understand their role in regulating. C can you just tell me um, in, in what circumstances would, would, would Department of Consumer Affairs um, uh, uh, intervene where the, the bail bondsman was not doing what they were supposed to, and, and when would DFS handle it so we can understand that? And then I, I'd like to get your assessment of how you think DFS is doing regulating this, this industry, because that will inform my you know, willingness to direct people to complain to them. Sure, so as a, as a matter of regulatory authority uh, as it stands now, and then I'll speak to what it would look like if these bills were to become law. Um, as it stands now, uh, the only regulatory authority that DCA has here is under the consumer protection law. So if something that a bail bondsman is doing rises to the level of a deceptive practice under that law, we, uh, we can begin an investigation and build a case to bring an action. And that's something that we've done as we described in the Marvin Morgan case. But as you alluded to, the state DFS is the licensing entity here. So the enforcement of particular provisions of state law is entirely within their authority. Um, if these bills were to become law, the new requirements in local law are something that we would enforce and we would definitely want to get complaints on. So if someone uh, were to fail to post a consumer bill of rights, if they were uh, to not post the sign with the information about their business that would be required, that's something that DCA could issue a violation against that agent for. And that's something that we could enforce by means of our patrol inspectors who go out into, into storefronts and check for compliance with local laws and regulations. So I think the, the balance would shift in uh, were these bills to become law. And I think it's important to note that um, we find in other areas that if, we, if there is non-compliance with requirements like posting a sign or a disclosure, we often find that there's deeper problems with that business. And so I think that we will uh, come by information that's very useful to our enforcement of the consumer protection law through the enforcement of the requirements that your bills would add. Your assessment of how well DFS is uh, responding to complaints? So I can't speak to DFS. I think we have, uh, we're focused on what these bills would add in terms of benefits for consumers and protections for, for consumers. Uh, I will note that in the Marvin Morgan case that we brought, uh, the DFS did revoke that agent's license before our action was filed. So my chief of staff and counsel, who's much smarter than I am, um, reminded me that in the controller's report, it seems to be DFS is positioned that if a bail bondsman is operating without a license, that DFS no longer has jurisdiction over them to, well, you know, pull their license that they don't have. Does that sound right to you? Are you familiar with that from Controller Stringer's report? So we have reviewed Controller Stringer's report. I uh, did, uh, wait, what? You haven't read? We, ha we have reviewed it. Have? We have reviewed it, yes. yes. Okay. Um, along with several other reports that were submitted to us by advocates. Um, on that particular question about DFS's interpretation of its legal authority in the case that a business is operating unlicensed, I'm not in a position to, um, to weigh in on that, but we can follow up with you about that afterwards. Well, so I, I do look forward to our mm -hmm. trying to work this out, um, and I appreciate the openness that you bring to the, to the issue. Mm -hmm. for, for me, for us, I think that's gonna be, you know, kind of something that we really need to dive into, and, and what, what is DF DFS supposed to do versus what you're supposed to do, and, and, and making sure that people don't get lost in the, 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 the crack there. My last question, you know, I was in the state legislature as Chairman Espinal was, and when you come to the council, you realize there are limitations on your jurisdiction, you have to get creative. Um, has anyone thought about recognizing as a deceptive practice any violation or any substantial violation of the, the substantive rules and regulations that govern what a bail bondsman can do? In other words, that overcharging uh, beyond the statutory uh, um, uh, guidelines or charging a, a fee that is not supposed to be charged. Do those all count as, is, isn't every violation of the, the, the state statute, the state regulations, DFS's regulations, isn't it a deceptive practice also? And, and 
and can we use that deceptive practice concept to get more oversight of the bail bonds industry? So I'd like to be careful because as I noted earlier, we have a pending case under the consumer protection law, which is the deceptive practices prohibition that you're referencing. Um, and I think that it would be helpful if we shared with you the complaint in that case to understand some of the legal theories that we're using under our consumer protection law to get at some of these practices. But at a broad level, uh, I think there are avenues that we're actively exploring in that area. We're happy to detail them for you um, after this hearing. Good. I, I look forward to that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Margaret? Thank you. Um, you know, in my district, I have, because we're half the courts, and so there are these bail bond agencies um, advertising. That's what uh, they do. So does DCA right now, do you send undercover inspector uh, to these bail bond business to see if they are engaged in uh, fraudulent practice, such as requiring additional charges for services? So as I noted earlier, council member, at the, under the current legal regime, DCA doesn't have direct regulatory authority of these businesses outside of just the general consumer protection law. And so we will, if we, uh, if we are alerted to or learn of in our own investigations, dis potential deceptive practices, we'll pursue those by appropriate investigative methods. Uh, and if we b believe that there's a strong case, we'll bring an action, but right now, it's there, we don't use patrol inspectors for these businesses because the, uh, the only tool at our disposal is the consumer protection law, which really requires time intensive, attorney driven actions. So if, um, if a consumer has a complaint, if they, if they were taking advantage of and if they go to DCA and file a complaint, then you would go and investigate. Yes, we would do, we do an initial screening of all complaints through our consumer services division, and if they felt it was appropriate to refer that to an attorney in the general counsel's office, that attorney would then uh, look further into the matter and evaluate appropriate remedies. So, so the answer is yes. Okay, so if an uh, individual or a family right now, DCA would be the only agency that they, that they would contact uh, if they feel like they're being uh, taken advantage of. Uh, no, the, they could contact the State Department of Financial Services, and in fact, the, the legal authority and jurisdiction of the DFS is much greater than, um, than DCA in this area because they are the licensing entity. And we do know that um, many consumers direct their complaints there because they have uh, legal powers that are not within our grasp. But how would they find that out? I mean, that, there's no uh, signage or whatever right now being posted at these bail bond plays. There are certain requirements under state regulations about what documentation um, needs to be provided to a consumer, as I noted in my testimony. Um, we can follow up with you about what exactly those are and what exactly a consumer sees pursuant to state laws and rules right now. And but also, do they receive that in different languages? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question off the top of my head as it's a state regulation, but we'll find out for you. Um, but to your broader point, I think that we, the reason we agree with what you're getting at here, which is that the consumer needs more information than they currently have, and that's why we're supporting both these bills. Thank you, yeah, because they're getting people at a most vulnerable um, moment that they would just you know, do whatever they can to try to help their family, and that's when they get taken advantage of. And I think with the, the legislation uh, that my colleagues are you know, providing, that will definitely give uh, the consumer more protection and information in terms of what they can do. Thank you, Chair. On average, how many complaints does DCA receive regarding bond bail agents? Uh, at the moment, we don't break out our complaints for this industry because it comes in as a general consumer protection law complaint. Um, so we, we don't have that information available, but were these bills to become law, we would obviously reconfigure our complaint system to key it to uh, specific violations that are being added. Are there any uh, trends or specific violations that you see uh, that are common? when you receive a complaint? Our entry into this space is relatively recent. As I noted, this case, the case that we're working on now in Supreme Court uh, was only brought in February, uh, but we, have, we found a number of what we believe are deceptive practices um, in that case, and we're happy, to, uh, we're happy to share that information with you to get a better sense of what we found in our investigation. But so the, the agency does believe that more needs to be done to protect consumers and there is an issue 
uh, across the industry? We do believe that more needs to be done to protect consumers, and that's why we're supporting both bills. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank Shannon. you. You're free to go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, next panel, we have Elizabeth Bender, Sergio De La Pava, Scott Levy, Catherine Gonzalez. We're gonna, we're gonna ask for a, a three minutes on the clock. Can we get three minutes on the clock? And you may begin. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Scott Levy. I am special counsel to the criminal defense practice at the Bronx Defenders. Uh, thank you to both committees for the opportunity to testify today. Um, for decades, New York's bail system has been dominated by the for-profit commercial bail bond industry. In moments of intense crisis, when a loved one has been arrested and is threatened with pretrial incarceration, people are forced to navigate a predatory system designed to exploit their anxiety and their desperation to obtain liberty for friends and family members. Bail bond companies operate largely in the shadows with no transparency, accountability, or meaningful recourse for their frequent violations of the law. The impunity with, with, with which the, they operate inevitably leads to abuses, charging illegal fees, improperly retaining collateral, and causing unnecessary delays in, of detention by delaying the posting of bonds. And even when they operate within the law, bail bondsmen extract millions of dollars from vulnerable New York City families, overwhelmingly from low-income uh, communities of color every year. This tax on freedom is both immoral and unnecessary. We applaud the Council for attempting to bring some transparency and accountability to a system that for too long has taken advantage of our clients, their families, and their communities. And that is why we are proud to support the two bills before the Council today. While these proposals highlight the excesses of the commercial bail bond industry, however, they cannot resolve the fundamental tension inherent in the system. A profit-driven industry should have no role in determining anyone's liberty or freedom. Every day, the Bronx Defenders hear stories from our clients and their families about their experiences with the commercial bail bond industry. They are almost uniformly negative. People must navigate a confusing and opaque system, an opaque system with little or no assistance. There are no guides or rating systems to help people figure out which companies are trustworthy, responsive, or ethical. Indeed, the process does, seems designed to keep people in the dark. The offices of most bail bondsmen provide little or no information about the bond process or the rights uh, of family members seeking those bonds. Frequently, prospective sureties are not even given copies of the contracts they are required to sign, nor are they given explanations of the myriad and often illegal fees that are added to their bills. Bail bond agency regularly operate under multiple business names with various phone numbers all leading to the same office, making comparison shopping virtually impossible. This lack of a transparency encourage, it encourages abuses. Though the law provides that premiums charged by a bail bondsman may not exceed cer certain statutory limits, inclusive of any additional fees, bail bond companies regularly charge extra fees in violation of state insurance law. Because our clients, families, and friends are desperate to get their loved ones out of jail, and because consumer rights information is overwhelmingly absent or hidden from view, they often have no realistic option to, but to pay these fees. We regularly hear stories of bail bond companies illegally retaining collateral after a case is over, refusing to return phone calls until our clients, families, and, fr and friends simply give up on trying to recover their money or property. Delays in the posting of commercial bail bonds are also a regular occurrence, leading to many unnecessary days in jail. In one Bronx Defenders case, the family of a 16-year-old 
client paid a bail bond company, but the bond agent never posted the bond with the court. After a number of days passed without any action or response, the Fre Bronx Freedom Fund agreed to post the bail. I will. Sorry. I, we, I'm sorry. We do have to keep as close to the yes. clock as, as, as possible. I, I, will, I will end just by saying that this industry is, is completely unnecessary under s existing state law. The bail, uh, the bail laws of the state already provide multiple alternative forms of bail that would make this industry uh, obsolete, and we encourage the council to uh, support efforts to increase the use of uh, alternative forms of bail until uh, comprehensive bail reform is passed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is Sergio De La Palma with New York County Defender Services. I agree that it's, a com it's an unnecessary industry, but it's one that has gained just tremendous prominence through kind of just force of habit. So the situation of New York County Defender Services, obviously we're in Manhattan and we represent a great many indigent people yearly, and in the overwhelming majority, when our clients go in front of a judge uh, for a bail determination, the judge is setting bail in only one of two forms, either cash or these commercial bail bonds. Now, obviously, the vast majority of our clients do not have a great ability to post cash. So what has happened, what's developed, and what's become entrenched is an incredible reliance on this industry, and this balance of power has been noticed by them and is ripe for abuse, and that's the situation we're in right now. So clearly, we applaud um, both of the proposals as a means of bringing to light a great many of the abuses that my clients' families um, constantly are bringing to me and, and our attorneys. Things like, um, as has been pointed out, a, a delay in posting the bond for no good reason. Um, posting the bond or, or not posting the bond because the client has a hold, that means they're not going to be released, but yet still um, not keeping the fee even though you have in no way risked losing anything since the client was never released and obviously would of necessity have been there for the next court date. It all, it all stems from this entrenched practice by judges um, and maybe um, other stakeholders are to blame for not pushing the many other alternate forms of bail that are out there. But I've been coming to this uh, to testify before you all for, for a couple of years where we have um, tried to stress that there are these other forms of bail and I see no appreciable improvement in terms of utilizing these other forms of bail. Um, and, and I think that our efforts to educate the judiciary, to educate the other stakeholders, while laudable, has not had the tangible effect I would have hoped. Uh, one solution would be to eliminate the industry altogether, and that's what I'm in favor of. But in the alternative, at a minimum, the statute, our, our state statute, and I understand that's not the province necessarily of this hearing, should be amended to require that judges put forth three forms of bail. That would ensure that things like unsecured bonds and partially secured bonds start to be used in, in meaningful instances. This would cause essentially competition for the commercial bail bond industry. This balance of power that I spoke of earlier um, would be, become a little bit less aggravated and that would, in essence, result in them either providing a genuine service to our client communities or just going out of existence because nobody's using them. So I applaud the, the council for uh, these, both of these measures. I just think something deeper is, is going to be required at the state level to truly um, remove this injustice. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Catherine Gonzalez. I'm a staff attorney at Brooklyn Defender Services. I'm in both the criminal defense unit and the Padilla unit. Is your mic on? Unit. I don't know if your mic's on. It's just talking up to you. That's it. Can you hear me now? That's good. Okay. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you um, with regards to the harm that's brought by commercial bail bonds to our clients and their families. Uh, BDS urges the council to pass both of these in, uh, provisions, 510 and 724, to mitigate some of the harm that uh, has been brought forth before the committee today and to increase transparency for consumers and our clients and their families. In our written testimony, we do detail some key amendments that we believe are necessary to achieve the council's goals. Uh, importantly, I do want to highlight that we believe there's no legitimate justification for commercial bail. Um, and. Uh, we believe it is a twisted and predatory financial transaction that is prohibited in nearly every other country, um, and that's for a very good reason. Today, I want to focus on 
uh, stories of the people that we represent. Uh, I want to tell you about Ms. J. She is the mother of one of our clients. She went to um, previously mentioned Mar Marvin Morgan bail bond um, to get her son bailed out of Rikers. She was very nervous for him because this was his first arrest and there was a bond that was set at a thousand dollars. But um, according to state law, that company was allowed to charge her a hundred dollars in uh, premium or, or compensation and um, that money was money that she knew she would not get back um, regardless of what happened with the case. Um, but the company charged her $300 instead. They said $100 for the premium and $200 in what they called courier fees to have the paperwork delivered. Um, the courier in this case was Lightning Courier Services and they were registered with the Department of State um, at the same address as the bail bond, Marvin Bond. Um, and we have had other clients that have paid as much as $1,000 in courier fees as well um, to the same courier. Um, so in this case, the, the Marvin's uh, company didn't uh, bail our, uh, our client out until about five days later. Um, we have spoken with DFS um, and the regulator in charge of overseeing bail bond businesses um, said that their position is that there's no charge uh, for overseeing bail bond. Uh, there's no statutory requirement that bail bonds agents actually bail anybody out, and there's certainly no deadline by which they have to bail somebody out. Um, and the day before Ms. J's uh, son, our client, was appeared was supposed to appear in court was when he was actually bailed out. Um, we also have uh, another case where Ms. W went to ABC bail bonds to get her son out of um, Rikers. He suffered from serious mental health issues and um, addiction and uh, she paid a lot of money um, up front and uh, with, with that case, if, briefly if I can just uh, tell you, he ended up being, after he was released, uh, taken to a psychiatric institution and he was hospitalized. And the bail bondsman company um, went to the hospital, um, had him brought back to court, exonerated the bail and kept um, a lot of money that this uh, that his mom had put together with the help of her community to bail him out, um, citing these other um, courier fees and other fees that they um, are allowed to do under the current law. So we do support both of the introductions. We do have some amendments that we'd like you to consider in our written testimony. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Bender. I'm an attorney with the Legal Aid Society's Decarceration Project. I want to thank both committees for having us here today. Uh, First, I think it's important that we acknowledge the context in which these bills arise. Despite months of high-profile talk about bail reform happening in Albany, New York State still jails presumptively innocent people who cannot pay for their freedom. And that is our state's humanitarian crisis right now. The advocates that you're hearing from today will not rest until meaningful bail reform is a reality, not just a talking point or a bargaining chip. But as long as there is cash bail in New York, it's our job to make sure that it is fair and that it is transparent. And the bail bond industry is neither of these things. That's why it's so important for this council to not just adopt what's in these bills, but to make their provisions even stronger. The proposed bills do a lot to educate customers and create meaningful mechanisms for complaints when bond agents break the law. These are huge steps towards stemming the massive transfer of wealth from communities of color to the pockets of commercial bond agents. But both bills need to be strengthened, strengthened to more completely inform consumers and to create more meaningful enforcement mechanisms. Two concrete suggestions I want to talk about now um, are to, the first one is to intro 510A. We think it should be expanded so that investigations are not just referred to the NYPD. When bond agents steal collateral, they're committing a crime, and crimes are already under the NYPD's jurisdiction. Requiring a referral only to the police doesn't create any additional capacity to, or duty to investigate something. The Attorney General, DFS, DCA are equally well suited, if not more so, to handle certain instances of consumer fraud, like the ones we see happening at the hands of these bond agents. So we think that they should receive those referrals too, and that the language of the bill should be expanded to say that referrals be made to all applicable state and city agencies. The bill should also include a reporting requirement to make sure that this council is aware of how many referrals are being made and what's being done about them. 
Second, if a bond agent violates either the rules in these bills or any other state or city laws, that agent should be required to post that information along with the flyer required by intro 724. If a New York restaurant has to disclose a failed health inspection because of an unclean kitchen before selling me a slice of pizza, a bond agent should have to announce that he has unclean hands before taking thousands of dollars from New Yorkers who are trying to get their loved ones out of jail. My last request to echo my colleagues is that this council use its considerable platform to adjust, address the judiciary's role in the bail bond industry. There is no legal preference for commercial bail bonds over what have come to be called alternative forms of bail that are bail paid directly to the court. They serve the same purpose as commercial bail bonds. They motivate an accused person to return to court or risk losing the full bond amount, but they eliminate the costly predatory middleman. Judges could end the reliance on the bail bond industry today by simply setting bail in a slightly different form. And this council, council should encourage them to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, and in particular for looking at the bill carefully with those recommendations. And there's more in the written testimony from, I think, many of us. Too. Good. Well, I appreciate it. Well, the council staff and certainly my staff will follow up and you know, maybe include you in, in the conversation. Well, certainly include you in the conversations we have with DCA, because um, those are some good, good suggestions. Um, uh, let me ask, well, well, first let me just make sure that you know and the, the public knows. Um, we are as frustrated as you are when it comes to moving the, the judiciary, God bless them, to use all of the tools that are at their disposal. And so right now, as a result of council funding, FIRA is doing a um, pilot project in the Bronx and Queens where they are providing judges with more information about a defendant's ability to um, uh, deploy or use or avail themselves of the other mechanisms of bail. So we are doing that and, and hopefully we'll get some good feedback from that pilot program and then expand that as, as well. You know, we're all kind of chipping away at, at this monster of cash bail with the tools that we, we have. Uh, that one seems, seems promising, so stay tuned. Um, I'd love to get just you to um, maybe rattle off some of the uh, kinds of excessive and, 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 and impermissible fees and scams that you have seen your clients have to, to deal with. I keep hearing about the infamous courier fee. Are there other uh, things like that? It's like you go to a car dealership and at the end you look at what you're paying for and it's always things you really have no idea what they are. Um, could you just, what are some of the things that you're seeing? I mean, we can start by the failure to return collateral, which isn't even a hidden fee. It's once the case is over. I have a, a former client who was acquitted a year ago next week in a jury trial and has not seen a penny of the collateral that his wife put up after he spent four days on the boat waiting for her to contract with a bond agent. So that's one type of abuse. We've also seen um, conversion or transformation of some of the fees into non-refundable fees. So in one of the cases that I was talking about with ABC bond, where they um, apprehended our client from the hospital and then got the bill exonerated, they charged mom an apprehension fee. So they charged her um, $5,000 that was supposed to be returned to her um, and said, this is money that we are now using to I guess, pay the bounty hunter who went to get him at the hospital. And like in that instance, they should have just called mom, who was the person who posted the bail, to find out that he was at the hospital. And that was the reason why he didn't check, check in with them. I'll tell you one thing I've personally experienced will be a bondsman uh, posting the bond and then immediately inventing new conditions that was not discussed with the customer. Um, for example, an ankle monitor. And when there's any kind of objection to this new condition that was, again, never discussed prior to taking the fee, they'll go in front of the judge and say, withdraw the bond, client goes back, they keep the fee. This all happening in the space of less than a week. They've taken no genuine risk. They've, they've invented out of whole cloth a new condition. And then when the customer, let's call it, objects, they go in front of the judge and the client gets returned to jail and they keep the fee. And they have not at least in their view, broken the law in any way. But it's an abuse. It's an abuse of power, and, and it's, it's in bad faith, in my opinion. I would echo what my colleagues have said and just highlight that the taking of collateral and the retention of collateral 
the wrongful retention of collateral is, is a problem that we see all the time, but the taking of large amounts of collateral also provides an incentive to the bail bondsman to, during the course of a case, either um, hyper-regulate our clients in that course and convert collateral into fees. So when there is collateral taken, there's a huge incentive to sort of manufacture reasons to then take the, that collateral at the end of the case. It's their way around the limitation on what they can charge. They just call it collateral, and it's just another, it's just an end run around the, the limitation on their fees. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, let me just mention, we've been joined by council members Maisel, Powers, and Lander. Well, Lander's been here. <laughs> just, just very quickly, can someone just walk us through the process of what an individual needs to go through in order to secure um, bail through one of the bond industries for those who are watching and don't understand. So the judge sets bail for twenty thousand dollars. The individual doesn't have the money to put up a cash to right. pay the twenty thousand. What 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 do they do? So let's start with that. It ha the accused person isn't the one that's contracting directly with the bond agent at that point. It's their family, right? And very frequently it's mothers. Um, so the mother, let's say in this example, goes to a bond agent's office and says my relative is in jail, you know, my child's in jail, here's what the bail is, and the bond agent reviews the case. They pull up information from publicly available websites, they, um, you know, listen to the, the details that the mom can provide. And then they, they present her with a contract, and there's this, you know, premium, this fee that's regulated by the insurance law. It's a graduated equation that dictates the cap on all fees that can be charged. Again, uh, you call it whatever you want, courier fee, apprehension fee, it is capped by these insurance laws. Um, that's that's going to be owed to the bond agent. That's their fee for undertaking the risk, for doing the work. That's not refundable. Then there's the collateral on top of that that also has to be paid, that is refundable at the end of the case. The bond agent collects that money, draws up a contract, mom signs it. Then it's up to the bond agent. They have to go to court, get the bond signed, and then depending on how they work, either they go directly um, you know, to, to post the bond and, and have the client be released, or they're gonna send a courier. Um, and it's that, I don't know, Scott, you mentioned these delays and sort of posting. You want to talk about how that happens? Sure. And and before I do that, I would just I would note that the actual experience of posting a bond often, um, you know, our clients and their families have no um, guide about which bond businesses may be ethical or not. They are generally walking down a sidewalk and picking a storefront. Um, and when they go into those storefronts, there's often nothing on the wall. There's no information. There is a plexiglass window, um, and the transaction between the person and the person behind the plexiglass window is completely opaque. Uh, and bewildering to most people. Um, and the requirements for an individual person, an individual case, are never really properly explained to our clients' families. Um, and then once the bond has been, uh, the contract has been signed, again, as we heard, there is no uh, regulation about when that bond then must be posted. The bond agent must go before a court to, to post the bond, but there is no, uh, often there's no sense of urgency there, at least on the side of the bail bond company, whereas on our clients' family side there is always a sense of urgency. Um, and we have seen time after time, days pass uh, between the signing of the contract and the posting of the bond. Um, and clients, very young clients, as in, a, uh, in the um, example that I provided, a 16-year-old client sat on Rikers for uh, close to a week uh, without any information coming back from the bond company until the family actually had to rely on a, uh, a nonprofit bail fund to do the work that they had actually paid the bond company to do. So then what we're also seeing is that the, the, they're also tapping into the collateral aside from the regulated fees by yes. putting these hidden charges. Yes, and so they'll take that collateral and then um, throughout the course of the case, we'll find opportunities to charge the client's family for sort of arbitrary uh, things that come up or that they manufacture during the course of a case. All right, thank you. Can I just add that an important part of that conversation when the contract is actually executed is that, um, well, or more importantly, not part of the conversation, is that the contract may include terms like check-ins, curfews, phone appointments, things like that that, you know, serve on, on at first blush, blush serve a rational purpose. Um, but 
you know, in, in 2011, the Times interviewed several bond agents who admitted that, um, you know, they, the, the criminal procedure law as it currently stands allows a bond agent to forfeit, to, to surrender the person that they've secured release for, for any reason. There's not even a good cause requirement. Tennessee, for example, has a good cause requirement. We don't. It's arbitrary and it's capricious. And these two bond agents that the Times interviewed said, yeah, there's exploitation happens. And they said, you know, we feel bad about it, but if our boss says surrender that person, we have to do it. And it's these terms that act as a tripwire for that for our clients many times. But they miss curfew one day because maybe of an excellent reason, but the bond agent says, you know what, I'm, I'm, tired, of, I'm tired of underwriting this bond, I'm gonna surrender you. And they end up back at Rikers um, and, you know, if and when they get the collateral back, maybe the family can post another bond, but that's not always the case. Right. Well, thank you for all the work you do on behalf of these families. Appreciate it. Well, we have more questions. Okay. Uh, Brad? Uh, thank you to, to both chairs here, and, and especially thanks to you guys for the work that you do every day and for shining a light on this and bringing it for us. I, you know, I hope you hear that while we are um, considering these two bills, which obviously I certainly support and I appreciate uh, Rory and the speaker bringing them, the, the horror of the broader industry of wealth-based detention is, is whatever, we share your outrage about it. I wanna um, just make sure I understand this issue of even without reform in the state law and even where judges are still setting bail, um, what you spoke about at the end uh, that they could be doing to prevent exploitation within the, I just, I, if you yeah. could just elaborate on that a little, it would sure. help. So Massachusetts provides a pretty straightforward template for this. Uh, starting in the 1980s, it was, it was sort of starting to be well chronicled there that the bond industry was incredibly abusive. And the judges in Massachusetts, just as a group, stopped setting bail bond, or really what specifically they did was never set cash bail that was more expensive than the collateral a bond agent would require. So there was no longer an incentive to go to the bond agents. And they just essentially went out of business, and now they're outlawed. But for 30 years, it was just sort of a de facto practice on the ground. New York state law provides for nine forms of bail. Commercial bonds are only one. No one form has any preference over another. There's nothing stopping judges from never setting a commercial bail bond again. They could set cash and a partially secured bond, which serves the exact same purpose. It takes a small deposit from the accused or their family, and the loss of which and the liability for the larger bond is a big motivator to come back to court, and they don't lose the non-refundable fee. You take out this middleman. Who writes those partially secured bonds? How do you get those? They're a contract directly between the surety, who's generally gonna be a family member of the accused person, and the court. So it's, it's all executed in court by a judge or a clerk. Everything is out in the open. The contract terms are clear and regulated very clearly by the criminal procedure law. And again, our law requires judges to set two forms. It is just custom and practice that causes them to set cash bail and bond. And you know, Council Member Lanthman mentioned the Vera Institute, they did a study last year on these alternative forms of bail, which is a term I reject. There's nothing alternative about them except that people have like, acted like they didn't exist since 1970. Um, but they could be used far more expansively. Um, I, you know, what Vera is doing is great as far as raising the profile, doing really important studies to provide good hard data, that these are just as effective at bringing people back to court as insurance company bail bonds. Are those partially secured? Uh, does that, are, is that happening anywhere in the New York system right now? I hear anecdotally, Scott practices day to day in the Bronx. I hear anecdotally that Bronx judges are setting them with a lot more regularity than they used to. So I think they are gaining traction, but it is a slow uphill battle. That's true, although the Vera Institute actually did a three month study of alternative forms of bail across the city. Um, the Bronx is the place where they are most commonly used, but in that three month period, I believe the number of partially secured and unsecured bonds that were issued were about 54. Uh, citywide in that three month period, there were only 99 of them. So while there has been movement, we're talking from nothing to a drop in the bucket. Um, you know, one of the major hurdles, there's two sort of major hurdles to the use of these alternative forms of bail. One is just a culture that has built up around the commercial bail bond industry, and the other is just logistical. It has to do with the paperwork that the court clerks are required to do when the court itself is taking the bond rather than the bail bond industry. Largely what has happened is that the courts have externalized the cost of the paperwork to the bail bond industry and relied on the bail bond industry to do the paperwork. 
but all at the expense of our clients and their families, right? There are all of these other costs that come with that um, that we're here today to, to highlight. And I just want to quickly add, if I can, it's my experience that um, we ask for these what, what have been uh, come to be known as alternative forms of bail all the time. When I'm in arraignments, I ask for them all the time, and I try to prearrange with my client's family all of the paperwork and fill out as much as I can to incentive, like to provide an incentive to the court. Like, look, this is really, really easy, and it can happen right now. But um, I have myself heard multiple judges kind of justify the not granting of these other forms of bail because they don't know them or they don't understand them as well. And I have heard judges say, this is the business of bail bondsmen. It's like, just go to bail bondsmen. They know what they're doing. We as the court don't know what they're doing. This business is better equipped to handle this than the court. And that's um, a misconception that should be, that should be tackled. And remember that when um, we're saying two forms of bail, we're really speaking about one because nobody who can afford to pay the cash right. would go to a bail bondsman. So it's really one, they have a monopoly in essence on our client communities in terms of if you wanna see your son be released from Rikers, you must deal with us. Um, Mr. Chair, I wonder if we could think about, I don't know that we've ever done a resolution um, uh, aimed at judges as opposed to other forms of you know, executives or legislatures, but maybe we could look in this instance at doing a, an accompanying resolution to these pieces of legislation, uh, you know, asking judges to consider these alternative forms and communicating that to them. Obviously, that's not the power that we need in Albany to make this reform, but it might be an additional step worth looking at in addition to this package of, of very good legislation. Um, my last question, Scott, is for you because in the course of this hearing, and it's 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 not it's it's slightly off topic, but in the course of this hearing, someone um, called my attention to this uh, thread that you guys tweeted the other day about a client of yours that you were uh, posting bail for, um, and uh, this problem of people being held longer than it, it, it blocked from your access, even though there's a council law that's supposed to not let corrections hold people in transit. Um, and that that's not being followed by corrections. And so since you guys are here and since that's our law, um, if you can cast light, any of you, on what that issue is and, and what attention we should be paying to it, it would be helpful. Sure, I, I, I can briefly cover that. You know, this council passed a package of bills designed to address some of the issues around bail payment and release. Um, and I think it is safe to say that progress uh, has been uneven uh, in, in um, uh, making those those bills a reality it, it is it is true that it often takes hours many many hours for someone to be released once bail is paid or the bond is posted um, there are delays really at every point during that process um, and as has been highlighted uh, corrections often relies on fax machines to do a lot of its work so that there's there are there are delays inherent in the system and those delays and the costs associated with them always fall on the backs of our clients uh, often through hours of uh, unnecessary detention. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let me mention we've been joined by Council Member Ulrich from Queens. And our next uh, panel, um, sorry. Victor Herrera from Just Leadership, um, Ted Min Wan from the Urban Justice Center, Amanda Perez, um, Bail Bond Afford Accountability Coalition. And as my co-chair, um, Councilmember Espinal, returns, I have to excuse myself. There is a budget negotiating team meeting that is starting uh, five minutes ago. And uh, i got to be there if I want to fight for all these good uh, criminal justice reform projects. So thank you all very much, Chair Espinal. Thank you. Uh, you may begin. Just state your name for the testimony. Make sure the mic is on. Um, and then you can point it towards. Oh, hello, you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you, you, can, you can shift it towards you. Hi, my name is Victor Herrera, and today I provide testimonies that directly impact the individual who has experienced the abuses that are prevalent with the bail industry and the criminal justice system. An incredible marketing platform that allows predatory discriminatory practices of this private industry to go unchecked. I'm a member of a Just Leadership USA and the Close Rikers and Free New York campaigns to transform our criminal justice uh, systems. 
Our priority is to dec decarcerate the jails that are filled with people who have been the subject of discrim discriminatory policies and penal provisions. Our jails are filled with young adults and adults alike who are majority black and Hispanic. Closing Rikers and reducing jail populations with fair judicial, judicial process is what just, just Leadership demands. Just Leadership is an organization of directly and indirectly impacted people who peacefully campaign and organize to expose the discriminatory and predatory criminal justice policies that treat people of certain classes differently. If we are to accomplish the closure of such barbaric jails such as Rikers and reduce the jail and prison population, many city and state level policies must be reformed. The constitutional right to presumption of innocence must be restored and pretrial detention must be eliminated. We must ensure a decent and humane approach to treatment of the poor vulnerable communities. We treat our citizens as, they, as if they are cattle or a commodity to serve the money-making purposes of corporations. A clear message must be sent by the city council that New Yorkers will not be treated as a product for pro profit-making purposes, but rather as citizens to be treated equally and fairly in all our affairs as the United States. To accomplish our efforts here and nationwide, we as a city should demonstrate the importance of this effort by reining in and controlling the practices that permit for jail population to grow under the predatory bail industry, and we must overhaul the bail industry by providing regulatory oversight and consumer protection. Bail is a serious factor considered in the initial stages of the criminal process, and more importantly, the presumption of innocence is seriously undermined when bail is set at levels that cannot be met by poor and minority, by poor and minority men and women of color. We must mobilize at all levels of government to end the practice of making people pay for their freedom and end cash bail entirely. Intros 510 and 724 are good starts that over time and consideration can lay, good, can lay a good foundation for further reforms and protection for all people fairly and equally. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Simon Wan. I'm a staff attorney at the Community Development Project of the Urban Justice Center. The Consumer Justice Practice Group of CDP represent low-income consumers who are faced with issues such as unscrupulous debt collectors and fraudulent business practices. While others have testified to reasons why the commercial bail bond system is an unnecessary evil, we as consumer advocates will focus on the burdens and the injustice inflicted upon bail bond customers and their communities. Who are these bail bond customers? They are innocent New York City residents operating as consumers in the bail bond marketplace. They are the ones who, knowing that their loved ones are behind bars, seek out bail bond agents to assist in obtaining their loved ones' freedom. At this stressful time, these consumers are extremely vulnerable to the tactics that unscrupulous bail bond agents uses to fleece them of their limited resources. While these tactics are illegal, it is near impossible to bring unethical bail bond justice agents to justice in court because almost none of these bail bond transactions are properly recorded. While bail bond agents often request multiple signatures on multiple documents from consumers, the consumers are invariably denied a copy of whatever documents they have executed. As a result, the consumer often has no proof of the amount of money they paid, what their money paid for, what they are entitled to have returned, what they would be responsible for if they're accused of just to have shown bail, or who is the entity responsible for returning their collateral when the case ends. Typically, because there's no paper proof of any of the above, it is near impossible for loved ones to obtain any relief from a court of law when they have been taken advantage of by bail bond agents. However, bail bond agents often miraculously produces these documents when they sue a consumer in civil courts if a defendant are judged to have jumped bail. DFS has said that because these are contracts, therefore they cannot regulate them. We are here today because we believe the New York City Council can help fix this issue. Moreover, we believe that the New York City Council has a responsibility to fix this issue. For far too long, bail bonds agent in this city has gone largely unregulated, and they have taken this vacuum of oversight to prey on consumers with impunity. The New York City Council can pass, start by passing intro 510A and 724, making sure that there's clear signage in each and every bail bonds office to let consumers know what their rights are when obtaining a bail bond and where they can seek assistance when and if those rights are violated. It could ensure that every consumer who walks out of a bail bonds office with a bail bond for their loved ones also walks out with a written contract fully detailing the responsibilities of both parties in a language that the consumer can actually understand. Intro 510 and 724 mostly aims at disclosure of consumer rights from bail bond agents. If the bail bond agents are not violating the laws, they have nothing to hide. 
I'm sure you're aware that overwhelming majority of criminal defendants in New York City are members of the low-income communities of college. So too are their loved ones, the consumers who try to obtain their freedom through commercial bail bonds. While the monetary costs to these communities are astronomical, the damages caused to these communities in the forms of innocent people in jail because they cannot afford bail bonds, in the form of families not being able to afford rents or basic necessities because large amounts of money have gone to unscrupulous bail bond agents, these damages are incalculable. We ask that you not to wait for Albany to decide on bail bond reforms that may or may not happen. We ask you not to assume that the state laws and regulations in place are being followed or enforced at the state level. And we ask you to stop reversing damages caused to low-income communities of college by this industry in New York City today. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to even share the experience that I um, went through with my brother. My name is Amanda Perez. I work as a real estate agent in the Bronx. My brother Dylan is 20, although I am his sister. Um, I did raise him like a son. In July of 2017, my little brother Dylan was arrested on a gun possession charge, a gun possession charge, and was being held at Rikers Island. His bill was 40000 an amount my family could not afford, and so we signed a contract with the bail bonds company in the Bronx. They agreed to post his bail, and in turn, we had to pay a $2,600 fee and then give them 3000 for collateral. Um, I do not make a lot of money, and so I had to use all of my savings, and I also borrowed from loved ones to scrape together um, the 3000 plus and other fines to pay. According to our contract with the bail bonds agent, I would be returned the collateral if my brother voluntarily returned to court for his hearings. From early July to late to late September of 2017, my brother was out on bond. During this time, he made, a, he made all of his appearances and checked in with the bail bonds every week. In September, my brother made a mistake. He was not mentally healthy, he was depressed, and he panicked easily. When he came for one of his hearings, he saw the detectives that arrested him initially and thought that they were gonna take him back to Rikers. He got scared and ran away. I immediately called the company to explain, and they assured me that they would do everything to keep, to make sure that Dylan stayed out on bond as long as I um, got him back to court. I frantically called my brother, and once he realized his mistake, he returned to court a few hours later. The part was closed for the day, so the bail bonds representative said that we can come back the next day. Dylan agreed, and he and I went to court together the next day to appear before the judge. But as soon as we walked into the courthouse, Dylan was ambushed by two bounty hunters in the elevator um, who were waiting for him in the court. A few days later, at his bond reinstatement hearing, the judge offered to reinstate the bond, but the bond's representative said no. They were no longer willing to post his bond, and and wanted it exonerated, so instead he went back to Rikers. From the beginning of the process, representatives of the bail bonds company lied to me. First, I was told to contact someone who allegedly worked for a nonprofit agency that would be able to help me as an attorney in securing my brother's release. That was not true. The person the company recommended I speak with, I, I speak with was in fact a bounty hunter who threatened to garnish my wages and have my real estate license suspended if I, if I do not do what the company told me to do. Second, rather than help reinstate my brother's bail, as they promised, the bail bonds company hired bounty hunters to apprehend him. When the judge at my brother's hearing offered to reinstate the bail, the bail bonds company refused and instead requested that the bail be exonerated. Companies like this do not help families in need. They capitalize on the people's vulnerabilities for monetary gain. After my brother's bail was exonerated and he was taken into police custody, the bail bond agent refused to return my collateral that I provided even though my brother voluntarily returned to court for his hearing. The bail bond agent claimed that the collateral would be kept as compensation for his expenditures related to apprehending my brother, but the bail bond agent was fully aware that there was no expenditures needed to apprehend my brother. The bounty hunters that apprehended my brother did so in the courthouse after my brother voluntarily voluntarily appeared for his hearing. The bail bond agent even stated in court that my brother had voluntarily, had voluntarily returned. I approached the bond company at a very vulnerable time for me and my family. I was pregnant, terrified of the legal and financial consequences I was facing, and worried for my brother's safety. The company took advantage of my position and preyed on my insecurities. The 3000 that the bond refuses to return is a significant amount of money for me and my family. More than that, my brother, who trusts me more than anything in this world, came to believe that I betrayed him as a result of how the bail bonds company behaved. What the bail bonds company got away with and continues to get away with is simply unfair and unjust. Yeah, I, Ms. Perez, I, I see the DCA Assistant Commissioner is still here. Can she file a complaint with DCA and can DCA investigate that case to help her get um, some of that money back? Yeah, I think that, that would be great if, uh, if you can, have you filed a complaint with anyone, Ms. Perez? 
is something that I'm working on. It's something that I am working on. Okay, so maybe you could talk to the commissioner from uh, DCA and see okay. if DCA can also help investigate the case. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you for sharing your stories. I'm sure it's not easy, um, and um, your information would, would be very helpful to guide us on how to best move forward. So thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I want to call up the next panel. We have uh, Elena Weissman, Bianca Tyler, Samir Khan, Alex Anthony, and Nick and Kalada. You may begin. No, good afternoon. Um, thank you to both committees for the opportunity to testify here. My name is Elena. I'm the director of the Bronx Freedom Fund. Um, we are a community bail fund which since 2007 has paid thousands of bails and fought for an end to the system that requires us to exist. We're the first licensed charitable bail organization in New York. We would be required and thrilled to comply with both of these bills. Um, and I am going to speak specifically about 510A. Our work is a stopgap measure. We're focused on harm reduction. So we are, we're paying bail for people who are incarcerated for their poverty and we're working to restore the presumption of innocence by helping people fight their cases from the outside. Um, we work to end a system that allows finances to determine freedom. And in the meantime, we are committed to seeing this and other similar regulatory bills passed so that no person is exploited by abusive practices. Because of the role that we play as a community resource and the knowledge that our staff has, since we're all licensed bail bond agents, we are well positioned to equip community members with knowledge of their rights when they do need to approach bail bond companies to free their loved ones when a less restrictive form of bail is not set. We do not charge our clients and we do not pay bonds, just cash bail, but when our clients or their neighbors cannot afford to pay a full cash amount and they have no alternative but to engage with a bondsman, we always provide information about maximum premium amounts, which we will continue to do. For as long as a system of wealth-based detention exists, we will fight it and we will serve as a watchdog for bail bond companies to comply with these regulations until we're out of business. Given our insider knowledge of the bail system, we do recommend several changes to the legislation that can aid in its impact and its implementation. These changes are outlined in our written testimony, um, and they'll fill in the gaps that we've identified based on our experience. And I just wanna highlight a few of those changes here. First is that, um, like my colleague said before, that this conversation needs to be underscored by a vision of systemic change that makes full use of New York State's bail statute relying on less restrictive forms of bail and doing away with a system that these exploitative financial relationships are necessitated by in the first place. Second, we employ the committee to adopt a more rigorous accountability metric in the bill text. Bail bond companies in New York City extract almost $30 million every single year in non-refundable fees, and the vast majority of their operations are underwritten by just nine multinational, multi-billion dollar corporations. So a $250 fine really amounts to less than a slap on the wrist especially at a time when our Republican legislature is gutting consumer protections at the federal level, New York really should be leading the fight in consumer protections and against abusive industry practices. And third, this is an opportunity to engage in some form of restorative justice. Any fees that are collected should be earmarked for reinvestment into the communities which have long been exploited by unregulated bail bond company practices and dedicated to racial and socioeconomic justice. So thank you once again for your commitment to fair regulations and for the opportunity to testify. As an organization with both staff and clients who are directly impacted by this industry, we hope that our testimony is taken seriously and that the committee continues to push for true reform. 
Good afternoon. My name is Bianca Tylik, and I'm the director of the Corrections Accountability Project at the Urban Justice Center. We're a nonprofit criminal justice advocacy organization committed to eliminating the influence of commercial interests on the criminal legal system and ending the exploitation of all those that it touches. I want to thank Chair Espinal and fellow members of both committees for the opportunity to speak with you today in favor of your efforts to regulate the commercial bail bonds industry and to strongly urge that you encourage our state legislators uh, to eliminate the commercial bail bonds industry and eventually uh, money bail altogether. Passing intros 510A and 724 is an important step toward regulating the commercial bail bonds industry and cur curbing its predatory practices. Like many other industries that intentionally exploit the low-income and minority communities targeted by our criminal legal system, the commercial bail bonds industry has long gone without oversight. It is refreshing to see New York City take interest in increasing accountability of the industry with these two bills. But quite frankly, these reforms are not enough. Beyond the abusive practices and illegally assessed fees addressed by these bills is an irreparably immoral business model that draws on the limited resources of economically distressed communities. The only way that we will ever end mass incarceration in our city or more broadly is by rooting out the industry reliant on it. Money bail puts a price tag on freedom and in doing so it creates an exploitative opportunity for for-profit driven uh, bail bonds companies that barter with people's lives. In short, they capitalize on poverty and selling freedom at a discount, but nevertheless at a detrimental cost to communities devastated by the injustice of our criminal legal system. New York City must protect those most vulnerable, low-income communities of color from these predatory companies. In closing, I want to share a recent experience that helps put this discussion into greater perspective. Last weekend, I traveled to Montgomery, Alabama for the opening of a national memorial for peace and justice in the Legacy Museum of Slavery to Mass Incarceration. I was reminded that commodifying black and brown bodies is an age-old practice that goes back to our country's racist roots. Just as companies in the 18th and 19th century sold insurance on enslaved Africans to enslavers, the commercial bail bonds industry is part of a broader effort to extract resources, wealth, and dignity from black, brown, black and brown people in our community. Let us work to ensure that we are not extending the legacy of slavery with our acceptance of the commercial bail bonds industry, but instead liberating our communities with its abolishment too. I urge the committee members to pass intros 510A and 724, but to also look further and begin paving a road towards Albany that ends the commercial bail bonds industry throughout New York State. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Zamir Khan. I'm representing my union, uh, Local 32BJ, uh, in this matter. Uh, I want to thank the New York City Council and the Consumer and the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for holding today's hearing. Uh, on behalf of myself and our members at Local 32BJ, we urge you to join us by supporting two bills to reform the commercial bail, in bail industry: Intro Number 724 and Intro Number 510. These basic consumer protections proposed in these bills will defend ordinary New Yorkers from the predatory practices of the commercial bail bond industry, a sector that perpetuates the social and economic inequities that we as a union fight so hard to end. As cities and states work to create a more equitable and humane criminal justice system, reforming the cash bail system and bail bond industry are two areas where reform is desperately needed. We're honored to be a part of this critical conversation in New York City and New York State and urge the council to stand with us on the right side of history. As a union, we are 163,000 members strong. Uh, here in New York City, we represent 85,000 building service workers who keep our city's residential buildings, schools, offices, stadiums, and airports clean and safe. We proudly fight for the rights of all of our members who are working class and people of color to live safe and healthy lives with dignity and respect. According to a report by the Prison Policy Initiative, there are nearly 650,000 people populating our local jails and 70% of those are being held pre-trial. Because we have a cash bail system here in the United States, if one can't afford to pay the sum, a person can either remain in jail until trial or use the services of a commercial bail bondsman to be able to await trial at home. When a person is at their most vulnerable and facing the possibility of awaiting trial in jail, they turn to a commercial bail, uh, bond company for support and help. Wealthy individuals, however, do not face the same hardship. They're able to pay their bond and await trial at home. It is for these reasons that it's critical for New York City to place stricter regulations on this industry. 
We need to ensure that in their moment of crisis, already vulnerable, low-income New Yorkers are not forced to pay unreasonably high premiums on their bonds that pushes them further into debt. Additionally, New Yorkers need to be fully informed of their own rights and whether or not the bail bond company they need to use is credible and reliable. When New Yorkers are most susceptible to exploitation, that is when we need to do everything in our power to ensure that they're not taken advantage of. Thank you for the time this afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Alex Anthony. I'm the director of Queens Operations at the Bronx Freedom Fund, a nonprofit that provides cash bail assistance of $2,000 or less to New Yorkers accused of misdemeanors who cannot afford to buy their freedom. We restore the presumption of innocence by allowing our clients to return to their jobs, families, and communities and fight their cases from a position of freedom rather than going to jail for their poverty. Thank you for considering our testimony today. Each year, tens of thousands of New Yorkers are held in city jails simply because they cannot afford to pay bail. For many families, the only way to buy a loved one's release is through the for-profit commercial bail bond industry. Commercial bail bonds now account for more than half of all bail postings in New York City. Despite the fact that New York law allows judges to set bail in nine different forms, including credit card, as well as unsecured and partially secured bonds, where individuals sign affidavits and post refundable fees as collateral directly with the courts, alternative, aka less financially restrictive forms of bail are rarely used, and bail is almost exclusively set in two of the most financially burdensome forms, cash or commercial bail bond. The Bronx Freedom Fund strongly supports these bills, as the powerful for-profit industry requires meaningful oversight and regulation. However, to achieve true bail reform, judges need to set the least restrictive forms of bail by utilizing these forms currently authorized under New York law. No one deserves to languish in the hellish conditions of Rikers Island or the boat simply because they cannot afford to pay bail, especially when they are legally presumed innocent. New York judges can end the reliance on cash bail and commercial bail bonds right now. Thank you again for, to the council for inviting us and for your care, careful consideration of our testimony. Hi, my name is Nick Enkelada Malinowski. I'm here today representing Vocal New York. In my work at Vocal and previously with Brooklyn Defender Services, I've met with dozens of consumers who have had problems with commercial bail bonds companies. These companies have been allowed to operate virtually unregulated, predatory, and exploitative businesses due to a total lack of oversight and attention by every level of government. These consumers are left without any protections, negotiating complicated, lengthy legal contracts at a moment of acute stress while their loved one is stuck on Rikers Island, and the only way to get them out is to pay money that the family does not have. Uh, the as we've heard already, you know, the commercial bail bond industry exists in only two countries, the United States and the Philippines. The rest of the world, as well as several states and localities within the U.S., has determined, uh, has banned the industry because the profit motive is in direct conflict with aspects of liberty and equity that are supposed to underpin judicial systems. According to the New York City Comptroller, commercial bail bonds are one of the most costly and punitive aspects of the criminal legal system in New York City. And yet, in 2017, more than 12,300 private bail bonds were posted in New York City courts with a total bond value of $268 million. The number of commercial bonds has grown 12% over the last year, and the, or the last two years, and the value of bonds has gone up 18%. In 1985, there was almost no commercial bonds posted in New York City courts, so it's a relatively new phenomenon that has grown recently. Um, as we've heard, the industry operates with almost no regulation. When you get into the back of a taxi cab in New York City, you know who your driver is, you know what their license number is, you know what your rights are, you know what their rights are, you know what number to call to make a complaint. Um, same thing when you go to a grocery store. Uh, and Instead, for commercial bail bond industry, there is literally nothing. You walk into the office, there may be the name of the company, but nothing else. Um, people are routinely asked to pay illegal fees, have their collateral withheld, are given the runaround when they're trying to get money back, often wait days and sometimes weeks after paying for a loved one to be released from jail, and then are often rearrested by bail bondsmen for specious violations of the contract and returned to custody while the bondsman keeps their money. 
Dozens of storefronts throughout the city operate without licenses. Others hide behind different DBAs, which confuses customers, and as we've talked to regulators, actually confuses the regulators as well. Um, we've had multiple, we've met multiple times with state regulators, the Department of Financial Services, with the Attorney General's Office, with state legislators, with city council members, and with the Department of Consumer Affairs over the past two years, but the status quo largely remains. Um, most of the agencies, particularly the state agencies, I know there's a question about DFS before, have basically told us that they don't have the capacity or the authority to regulate the industry in the way that we've asked them to. Um, speaking specifically of DFS, um, in the few instances when somebody actually knows that they can make a complaint to the state agency, which you would not know really in any other way, um, they often can will take action about a license, so maybe it's a, a bondsman who has a license in Virginia who's now operating in New York or something like that, um, but they will do almost nothing to help somebody get restitution or to get money back uh, that's owed to them. Um, and we've also heard from them, I know there's an, a, a, you asked a question initially about unlicensed bondsmen, and they've, we've gotten letters from them that basically said, this bondsman does not have a license, I cannot help you with your claim. Um, as you heard, Marvin Morgan's bail bonds was shut down, which is a result of advocacy from these groups, uh, which is a very positive result. But last month, I actually received a complaint from a consumer who had done business with a new tenant that has now replaced uh, Marvin Morgan in that storefront, which is basically the same complaint that people were having about Marvin. So we have the same problem with just a different bondsman's name attached to it. So I guess just. The point of that is to say that removing one bad actor did not actually change industry practices and did not reduce the problems that we see across the industry. Even if the industry was working entirely within the law, um, it would still be needlessly extracting millions and millions of dollars from predominantly low-income communities of color, uh, and there's really no place for the industry to, to exist. Um, I'll go real quick, but um, just as it relates to Rikers Island, I know it's the city's policy now to close Rikers Island. Um, all 12,300 people, or almost all of the 12,300 people that used the commercial bail bond last year spent some time at Rikers Island. Had they used an unsecured bond, you know, the court allowed for an unsecured bond to be used, none of those people would have gone to Rikers Island, so it would have reduced admissions by 12,000, which would have been uh, pretty positive. Um, Again, the comptroller estimates about $27 million extracted through legally allowable premiums, and then we know that it's millions on top of that of illegal fees, ankle monitors, things like that. Um, and then one last suggestion is that while we support the bills, and I have some recommendations for amendments, um, we'd also recommend a resolution supporting the New York uh, State Bill, the Senate Bill S8146, which would ban the industry throughout New York. And I think it's important to, as we've acknowledged throughout the day, um, acknowledge the limitations that the city council has in actually um, regulating the industry and say we've done everything that we can we really need the state to come in and um, bring some more teeth to that thank, thank you. you thank you for your testimony and for your insight uh, is there any public outreach that you're aware of that that's being done to uh, inform consumers about the unscrupulous practices that some of these bail bond companies are doing is there anyone flyering or kind of trying to get in the front lines before they go and visit a bail bond agent? Thank you. I know the, uh, the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund created a, uh, like a, a little pamphlet, a booklet that does go to consumers. Um, but again, as some of the public defenders mentioned, you know, it's the, the people who are uh, negotiating with the commercial bail bond people, uh, commercial bail bond businesses are not defendants in criminal court. So, you know, it's, right. even if you gave out these flyers in court, that's not necessarily going to get to the mother, the grandma, who's posting the bail. So right. that's right. a I challenge. Think, yeah, I think the other thing, though, with that is that that's almost too late. It's once the judiciary issues, a, like, cash and bail bond, that's their only option. And so even telling people, families, um, or the accused about the abuses, you know, when you let an industry out there dominate a particular field, and that's the only option for freedom, you're asking people to essentially be abused in that in that sense, and a flyer is not going to help that. Yeah, and I would add also, like the, even even in the cases where we've been able to go, you know, with uh, a consumer to a bail bond company and help them advocate and tell them what their rights are, um, people will say like, "Well, my, my option is like leave my son on Rikers Island or get taken advantage of," and they'll choose to pay the extra five grand, you know, to get their right. funds out. Thank you, um, Keith. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions, and thank you for all for the testimony and, and generally the work that you're doing in this area. Um, 
the I think I've been here for a few panels, and uh, the sort of reoccurring theme seems to be uh, ability to use nine different forms of bail, practices using two, cash and commercial. Uh, and I know some groups, Vera Institute and others, have been trying to, I, I read their report about uh, the other other forms. What is, is there an effort at, at new, you know, criminal court, Manhattan or anywhere else to work with the judges to look at? I mean, I think the challenge it sounded like on an earlier panel was the actual execution of using other forms and what might be included in terms of workload and things like that. But is, is, that, the, is that the lone challenge to looking at other forms or, or, and then well, the second question is, what are the ongoing efforts to actually work with the judges that are sitting in the courts today to encourage or, or uh, uh, not require, but encourage them to use other forms? Um, so I know that the, the, the Vera Institute pilot that was just referenced, they, I'm pretty sure they did another pilot in the 90s to educate judges about these less restrictive forms of bail and we're still in the same place that we're at right now. So I think um, as much as, as great as outreach is and as important as education and knowledge are, ultimately this represents a big culture shift. And so since there's not you know, an oversight panel for judges, we're relying on a pilot program that is making a recommendation, which is a good thing, but when it, it's not being followed. And so we, I've sat in court and watched them make recommendations on the record that are really strong and impactful and powerful, but not ultimately um, taken into consideration. Meaning they've asked for an, an alternative and the judge has said. Yes, you know. and for uh, cash and an amount that someone can afford using a metric that they have um, they have like a form that they use that, yeah, okay. So, so, uh, but you don't know of any ongoing effort, right? I mean, it sounds like there's been some past efforts to try to change it. Are there other, are there, uh, what are the obstacles for them using the other forms? I mean, it sounds like so what the last panel had made it sound like it was a paperwork issue. Is, are there other, other reasons they wouldn't want to use? Paper, it's, it's yeah, there are a lot of, there's pushback from the clerks, at, both in the courtroom and outside um, where people pay bail, saying that they don't know how to fill out that paperwork or that it's too burdensome and that they need to have resources to do that. I think the main barrier, though, is culture and that yeah. you know, yeah. judges get trained by the judge who went before them and they just do things that way because that's the way that things have been done. There's also a lot of advocacy from the industry. You know, the industry supports bar associations and works on political campaigns and things like that, so I think it's just in the fabric of the system and that's what we have. But there have been, I mean, oh, decades of work to train judges yeah, yeah, to yeah. not do it and it's not been effective. Got it. Yeah, I think that culture piece is, is massive is really the thing, because it's not just about not knowing how to fill out that paperwork or the paperwork somehow creating a tax on, this, on the system, um, but also their, uh, their just lack of even understanding how those other, um, other types of bail even work. I mean. I practice public defense in Massachusetts where we have no bail bonds, like there was no bail bonds industry, and the amount of cash bails is a fraction of what it is here. Got it. There's no bail bond, there's no commercial in Massachusetts no. today? Nope. Got it. Um, the, there was a, uh, I think Bronx Freedom Fund, uh, fund sorry. Um, you had a comment in your testimony I wanted to ask about, which is that the disclosure statement proposed by a bill should indicate that consumers have a choice in uh, what type they pay and other forms available to them. But if the judge is setting the form of bail, does that have meaning? To, I was just was questioning whether, or, or I just could clarify, if they can pay another form of bail if the judge has already set their at commercial or cash or. What, what, is that, what is that disclosure help with? Um, for people to understand that they have a choice. I think we're, like I said, like we're not paying bonds, but we'll have some people call us or come to our office and say, um, you know, my son's cash bail amount is $2,000, when really their, their choices are like a $20,000 bond or a $10,000 cash bail. And, what I intended to convey in that part of the testimony was that if we're creating a disclosure that is going to be public facing, it should indicate that since two forms of bail are required to be set, it should indicate how to find out what your options are by looking at the DOC website and looking up your, your loved one or whoever it may be. Gotcha. Yeah. And then the other suggestion is 
to ensure that they know that there are refundable and non-refundable yes. parts of that. Uh, yes. FL. Got it. Um, the and then just a little bit more. Sorry to uh, the uh, for for Nick. The you had some numbers. Can you repeat those numbers to me about how many bids was it? Twelve thousand. You said twelve thousand three hundred. Yeah, and a lot of that is pulled from the comptroller's uh, report on this that came out in January. Okay. It was twelve 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 thousand three hundred bonds in 2017. So that's like the number of piece of paper that went into court. Yeah, and then um, how? What percentage of the overall like what what is that percentage wise represent of, you know? of of people who are paying bail? Yeah, it's a l I think it's a little over fifty percent now. 50%. You know, cash versus bail bonds. Right. Okay. Gotcha. And when you said the point about they all go to Rikers and they wouldn't, can you explain that point to me? So one of the other forms of bail is an unsecured bond, which is basically uh, the person is in court and says, "I don't have any money on me. You know, my wallet's at the police precinct. Um, I make four hundred dollars a week. Um, I get paid in." 10 days, um, if I don't show up to court, you know, the judge, the judge can write a bond that says, don't give me any money today. If you don't come to court, you owe me $2,000. And then that person just goes home. When you use a commercial bail bond, uh, what happens is you gotta call grandma, you gotta, get, right, you gotta get together the money, you gotta go to the business, which is close to the courthouse often, but not in the You're courthouse. sitting in Rikers Island. And so Island at that time, the person that yeah. goes to Rikers, the defendant goes to Rikers Island while all that other Until stuff the money, the family gets the money. And the bonds then goes gotcha. to court pays, that kind of thing. So um, some people go to Rikers Island for two days while that happens. Some people, it takes a year to raise mm -hmm. the money and, and do that. And presumably the sentiment you raise is true. I'd rather not be at home, have my family member at home than not be sitting. Yeah. yeah. Um, the last question is the, the, on Friday there was an announcement around uh, implementing some version of online bail payment. Uh, just any feedback on that? I mean, I've heard I've heard varying degrees of receptiveness to it. It's I think it's up to twenty five hundred dollars. Any any sort of quick reactions to that announcement? There's a fee. Well, yeah, I mean, I there's a fee. Yep. There's like a two, two point three nine percent percent. Like a transaction Ding. fee yeah. for. Right. But I, it, so in order for someone to qualify for online bail payment, the judge has to have set credit card bail on their case, which is very rare. I mean, that's like one of the alternative right. forms of bail that we're talking about. Um, so we've tried to pay online bail many times uh, since it has come out, and so far with it, there's been one person who we could do it for. Um, so it's it's not a, a widely implemented system. So for it to work, the judge would have to set credit card bail, yeah, and then you uh, and it's got to, it would have to be up to only up to a certain Less amount. Less than $2,500. And then there's still that extra fee that's now being assigned. And then it's a fee of 2.25. Almost 2.4%. 2.4%. So extra money on top of your bail. Um, okay. Thank you for, uh, thank you. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Uh, we have the last panel. Peter Goldberg. Uh, Mich Michelle es Esca Escaverazzi, sorry if I mispronounced your name. June Rogers. Peter, Michelle, June, and Stephen. You may begin whenever you're ready. Good, Michelle, you can go first. Uh, sure. Uh, good morning. Um, Whoever wants to go first. Uh, I'll go first because I think we, this is a little awkward. Uh, I'm a, uh, work for the Brooklyn Community Bail Fund. We are a nonprofit that uh, very oh, much. Oh, so you should have been in the other panels. Yeah, but it's cool. This, is, yeah. <laughs> this, this could be interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, so I gave, uh, written testimony about why we support these bills. I think you've heard from numerous advocates about deceptive practices, about a lack of regulation, 
um, in part because this is incredibly awkward. Um, maybe what I'll talk about is even if we assume there are no deceptive practices and even if we, you know, I'll take the people sitting next to me, only charge the amounts that they're allowed to and are totally above board, commercial bail still punishes poor people, right? And it always will. As Nick from Vocal mentioned, around uh, anywhere from 16 to $27 million is being siphoned from low-income communities to for-profit actors. The average bail in Brooklyn is around $10,000. The legal fee that can be charged on $10,000 bail is $860. I just call out for this group that most New Yorkers do not have liquid cash in for $860 to pay in case of an emergency. That's simply beyond reach. So to say we need to regulate the industry, absolutely. To say that bad actors should be punished, absolutely. But there's no way to have this industry operate that does not punish people, right? So as, as Nick mentioned, and, and I'd very much agree with, um, the council is somewhat limited in what it can do around commercial bail. I appreciate that you all are taking these steps. I think it would be incredibly powerful for you all to pass a resolution supporting the state bill calling for the elimination of the industry. And I understand that means people lose jobs. People to my right would, I would lose my job too, right? Um, we should all be comfortable with the fact that this industry shouldn't exist. So thank you very much for your time. Is that me? That people do that? Are they here? You may begin. Next. Yes, good morning, Mr. Speaker and esteemed member of the, is this on? Just make sure, yeah, you hit the red button. That's there. Can you hear me? Good morning, sir. Um, my name is Michelle Eskenazi. I'm a lifelong New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I am a Cuban-American immigrant, proud to be Latina American, and I'm the owner of Empire Bail Bonds, and I'm also the president of the New York State Bail Bondsman Association. I'm also a domestic violence survivor and a crime victim, and I've always been a single mother. A consumer complaint in our industry is handled expeditiously by the regulators at the New York State Department of Financial Insurance, uh, DFS. Once received, whether in writing or online, the DFS will immediately generate an inquiry letter asking the bail agent for supporting documents and various details about the pending matter. It is common for the DFS to have all such documents within a 15-day turnaround time. Once reviewed, the regulator will either ask for more information or call on the agent for questioning. As the owner of Empire Bail Bonds, it's not uncommon for me to work around the clock. Moms and dads call us in the middle of the night, scared and afraid, and it's a big part of my job to explain the bail process from arraignment going forward. I'm very proud and respect, um, of the fact that judges and district attorneys and Department of Corrections um, respect who we are as an industry and as a company. One of the biggest issues that I have with bail reform as a Latina American, and I, and I would hope that people in the New York City Council would also have a very big issue with it, and I've heard it a lot here today, is uh, calling people, uh, one of my children is a biracial child, uh, you've hearkened back to calling people by the color of their skin. So I hear a lot, Mr. Goldberg and a lot of his friends calling people black and brown. I find that to be incredibly archaic, and as a proud New Yorker, I just think it should be removed from your branded rhetoric. You might want to remove that from the rhetoric. Um, the, this bill that you have in front of you, we don't really have a problem with. We are above board operators, and we absolutely would seek to help uh, with a consumer bill of rights. That's never a problem. So the only part of the, uh, the bill that obviously we would have a problem with is the other part uh, referring us out as criminal offenders to the police department. We are not criminal offenders. We are insurance agents. We charge a one-time one premium, and that premium covers that person's liberty through the final disposition of his case. And in the state of New York, it takes about two years to, to uh, get rid of a felony case. And that has nothing to do with the bail industry. That has everything to do with legal aid and their adjournments and all these defender um, organizations and their constant adjournment of cases. That has nothing to do with the bail industry whatsoever. High bails are a result of judges setting 
um, high bails. My company provides a service and it's important to have choices when a loved one is incarcerated. I understand that there have been actions by some unsavory characters in our industry and the fact of the matter is that there are bad actors in almost every industry. If you take a look at the legislature, if you take a look at the Catholic Church, you don't put the Catholic Church out of business because a priest does something inappropriate. The fact of the matter is there are bad operators from time to time. We as an industry do not reflect the one bad operator. We have been operating in the city of New York for decades. These individuals, although they, there should be choices in bail, no, no question about it, we don't believe that an indigent person, person rather, should linger in incarceration. We help people in the city of New York every single day. It's an inherent part of what we do at my company. We employ tons of people from all different backgrounds, and the attack on our industry today is really unfounded. The fact of the matter is, sir, with all due respect to your panel here today, I heard some of the people here today say that they've been testifying here for years. Well, you've never met with us, and we are mom and pop shop nation, and we would like to continue a dialogue with you in this regard and, and, and all others going forward. My name is Steven Zaluski. I'm the vice uh, president of the New York State Bail Bond Association. I also own one of the largest bail bond companies in the state, Affordable Bails. We not only have new offices in New York City and Long Island, but throughout the state. Um, I think it's important for us to understand something that keeps being talked about here, the, the, the punitive nature of paying bail and that bail costs money. I mean, it's unfair that people presumed innocent for some reason have bail set that costs them money because they're not guilty yet they're presumed innocent. And, you have to look at that and say to yourself, do we have prophylactic punishment in the state of New York for people accused of crimes before they're convicted? And I can give you two instances that happen every day that we do. Someone's charged with a DWI, we take their license and their car. That's a prophylactic punishment before conviction. And it's a, certainly an economic punishment, domestic violence. We issue orders of protection, preclude people out of their homes without any type of hearing. That happens every day. So to suggest that an insurance company, and that's what we are, we provide an insurance product, it's nefarious for us to be paid for our services is, is disingenuous. Because everyone in this room who's testified that works for a defender agency gets paid for their services in defending, the, defending someone. As do most of these defender agencies are tied now to charitable bail organizations who get private funding but also use the facilities of these agencies that are paid by the, by the city. Um, you know, the truth about uh, the number of people who sit in jail every day that can't afford low bails is, is interesting because there are studies that show numbers very different than you're hearing today. In 2012, the Criminal Justice Agency did a study and pointed out the following facts that I think you should know. 74% of the people who are arraigned are arraigned on misdemeanors, and 16% are arraigned on felonies. 50% of those people arraigned are automatically released. That number now, according to uh, Controller Stringer is up to 90% in misdemeanors. It takes about 48 hours for people to get out, bailed out for the most part. They're correct about that, but you know what the problem is? That's not the bail bond industry. That's the court system. For the city that never sleeps, we go to sleep after the courts close. If a family comes to me at 11 o'clock at night and says, my son was arrested, I just found out, I got off my three to 11 shift, I wanna bail him out. I can't go bail him out in New York City. If I was in Buffalo, my agent could bail him out then. We have to use the courts to bail them out. The, the statutes and the law allow for bail to be posted at the jail by commercial bail bond industries, but in New York City, we don't do that. So this delay in time and the number of people, realistically, is because of the inability for us to post bail 24 hours a day. I'm gonna leave you, leave you with some important statistics. $500 or less if you take an actual snapshot, an actual snapshot in one day in Rikers Island, the number of people on bail is $500 or less is 71. The number of people on $1,000 bail or less is another 133. That's 200 people out of 9,000 that are actually in, in jail. What no one talks about is why. Do they have a hold? Do, are, there, are there other restrictions? The reality is no one wants to talk about that part, and I'll leave you with this one thought that no one's mentioned today. All of these other forms of bail, the other nine that you asked about, should be utilized. The problem is people don't return. When they mention uh, Pennsylvania, they're talking about Philadelphia. They did what I call sign and drive. You swear to pay, you, you put up 10% or you sign for 10% and you leave. The failure to appear rate went up to 
Ultimately, over 10 years, it was a $16 billion deficit for people who didn't pay when they failed to appear. In that same state, with the limited number of bail that was done, there was a 100% return of people to court. And that's the thing no one's talked about today. Who's going to bear the cost of returning people to court who don't appear? It's estimated that if you remove commercial bail by Townsend University that did a study, it's $287 million in the first year and $200 million after that. That's the question that has to be asked. Who's going to be responsible to make sure people return to court? Well, they never answer that question because they assume the police department will do it or the taxpayer will pay for it to be done. That's the question that needs to be asked the most. Charitable bail should exist. It's important for really indigent people. These initiatives, I commend you for these initiatives. They're important. We do that every day. You want us to put it on paper and post it on the wall? Absolutely. So that when a complaint is made, we can have documents signed and say, see, we showed them this. Because if you don't think complaints are made by people that are untrue, of course, you know they are. I, I applaud that. But more regulation? Every time an agent does something wrong, they are brought before the Department of Financial Services and their license is taken. In fact, the lady that was here that talked about the money she didn't get back, the $3,000 on the Bronx bail, I walked outside and told her, go to the website right now. Put in a complaint, and I guarantee you within 15 days, the Department of Financial Services will contact you. And if you can support your claim, then what will happen is they'll compel that agent to return the money. That's the truth of how the system works. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is June Rogers, and I am the director for Victims Outreach through the Alliance for Safe Communities. Well, um, when I first heard of this meeting, uh, in my mind I was coming to say I oppose anything that has to do with bail reform, but listening to some of the testimony, I agree that the industry does need some regulations and some of the things, most of the things that you were saying were, uh, were fair, but <clears throat> my thing is I'm speaking for the communities that you all are supposed to represent. Um, my son was killed by a guy that was let out with no bond or anything, and um, they said he was low risk or whatever, and three days later, they, you know, he, he killed my son. Um, my thing is that we do need the bail industry. I'm hearing a lot of testimony where people are saying, oh, there's no need for it, but yes, there is, because if someone is required to pay a bond, the bond industry does a service for us, for our community. They keep tabs on these people. A lot of them, they're saying, oh, we're too poor, um, we can't afford bail, and we, we need to get out of jail. Well, this is what this guy said three days before he killed my son and they let him out. They sympathized with him saying, okay, you're poor. Let's be honest, there are a lot of people who really, if not belong in jail, they need to be supervised by these people. The bond industry will go and pick them up if they're out there committing more crimes and things in that nature. Where I'm from, the police agencies, the police departments are so fed up with this because it's like catch and release. You're, arresting them for nothing because then there's the turnaround that they're right back out and they're committing more crimes and no one is speaking about this. My thing is, is okay, fine. If you guys want to regulate the bond industry and say, okay, there's rules and things that they should follow, okay, fine. But I'm saying, please, whenever you guys meet on the subject, do not, as a warning, do not eliminate the bond industry altogether because they do provide a valuable service to us in our community. See, we don't feel safe where I am now because I, I live in New Jersey, I'm sorry. I live in New Jersey and they have eliminated the cash bail and the bail bond industry and that kind of thing. And our state is a complete mess. We're not safe. These people are running rampant, just like the gentleman said. Oh, well, um, 12,300 people would not have been arrested. They would not have went to Rikers. Where are these people going? They're coming back to us, to our communities. 
And, and it's not right. Everyone's talking about money, money, money. Well, how much can you put on a person's life? My son is dead because people are talking about money and you know, people being in jail and we, the bail bondsmen, they're taking advantage. Well, listen, my thing is, is if you guys are going to stipulate that, okay, um, you know, there's guidelines that the bail industry needs to follow, it's fine. I don't have a problem with that, but please consider releasing these people back into our communities with no accountability, no supervision. It's not fair to us. And, and, and that's what I came to say. I just want you guys to consider us the community that you're supposed to help when you're making these decisions, you know? And um, I'm, I'm getting a little emotional. Oh, thank you. But <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess for the industry, would you say that there are people being ripped off by bond bail agents? In no the question. There's not a question in my mind that people are charged fees they shouldn't be. The question becomes, um, how do you answer this one? Um, so a weekend bail comes, you can't post it, and now the, the transcript needs to be gotten so the bail can be posted. Do you believe there should be some sort of bail reform up in Albany? Um, no, we don't. No? Do, just no? Why? Well, I mean, I, is that what this hearing is really about, or are we here? I just want to hear your well, thoughts. I mean, you, 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 some of you have said things that had nothing to do with this hearing, so I just well, want to hear bail, bail beyond that. Bail reform as it's posited in the current statutes that they're proposing? Well, all of those statutes propose the elimination of uh, commercial bail completely. None of them call for a blend. None of them call for some of the things that are suggested here. Every one of those bills says the commercial bail industry should be extinguished. So, yeah, <laughs> if they want to completely extinguish the industry, sure. Right. As a bondsman and a member of the, um, as a licensed bondsman and representative of the community, I would say the problem here is you all have a financial incentive. How much money do you make a year? All right, I, we're, we're not going to do any cross. What is your annual salary? All right, so we're not going to do any cross questioning. Okay, I mean, so I, at some point you did bring up his name, so I'm going to okay. give Peter chances to respond. Yeah. So, to the point of um, should there or should there not be reform, the the money you all make and the money I make oh. exists because of this industry, and it shouldn't. There shouldn't be a financial incentive. And to the point of, and I, I'm so sorry for your loss. Um, we shouldn't be abdicating responsibility to for-profit actors to be keeping communities safe, right? Um, as far as I understand it, bondsmen can employ bounty hunters, and the contracts you all uh, sign with people can allow uh, the bond entities to enter someone's home without a warrant, right? We are allowing this industry to do things we do not allow police officers to do. Right? So it is, um, again, I'm so sorry, but people are not kept safe because of this industry. And if what we need to do is I ensure, if, if what we need to do is ensure that people come back to court, then we do that through the courts. And when we say taxpayers will have to foot the bill, they already are. They are just poor taxpayers. Right? So it's, um, uh, respectfully would say they disagree and this really is us taking an important function like ensuring someone comes back to court and and selling it out to an industry that shouldn't be responsible for that but the bail reform but, issue is not just whether or not someone returns to court it's what they're doing when you bleeding hearts are letting them out for free and they're running rampant through our communities. And with you saying, sir, that it's not the bail industry, the bail bond industry's responsibility shouldn't be for them for keeping us safe, who are we gonna rely on? The pol police oh. and the communities. Right. Oh. So we can, we can um, have that conversation Sorry. after the hearing. Yeah. Um, okay. But with that Thank said, uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.